Hello, welcome to Franklin Covey's weekly on leadership podcast series. My name is Scott Miller and I serve as your host and moderator each week. After our first year in the podcasting business, so to speak, we decided to write a book about 30 of our key guests. And coming out on September 7th is the new book from Franklin Covey called Master Mentors. 30 Transformative Insights from Our Greatest Minds. And since then, we've had over 150 episodes, totaling about 175 now. And we believe that HarperCollins will republish a new version of this book every year for as long as they're willing, I'm willing, and Franklin Covey is interested. So we'd love to have you pre-order and pick up a copy of Master Mentors based on 30 of some of our favorite guests from the first year of our podcast. Now today, I'm delighted to have one of Marshall Goldsmith's um, most preeminent um, coaches, Sally Hegelson, joining us. Her new book, um, How Women Rise, Break the 12 Habits Holding You Back from Your Next Raise, Promotion, or Job, is joining us, the author of numerous books, world-renowned thought leader on leadership issues, specifically female leadership issues, and a coach and and well-known advisor around the world. Sally, welcome to On Leadership. Thank you, Scott. It is such a pleasure to be here with you today. Sally, delighted you joined us. You and I met kind of virtually about a couple of months ago. You have been a longtime friend, partner, colleague, co-author of the famous Marshall Goldsmith, who wrote the book, of course, amongst many, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Marshall has a fairly a preeminent group of people known as the MG100, of which you are, I believe, one of probably the founding uh, coach members. Um, Very recently, I managed to claw my way in that group, not quite sure how, but became so interested in the contributions that you make to that group on a weekly basis. I looked you up at the many hundreds of coaches in that team, became very fascinated with your history, your background, and said, we've got to have Sally on what is now the world's largest weekly leadership podcast. Today we're going to talk all things leadership, specifically for females as well. Sally, will you take a few moments and sort of orient yourself to all of our listeners and viewers worldwide on your journey, how you came to write this book, and we'll get into some of the insights. Yes, certainly. Uh, This book particularly was inspired by the book of Marshall Goldsmith that you mentioned, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, which is about the habits and behaviors most likely to get in the way of successful people. And I thought Marshall's founding idea was brilliant, which is that the habits that can serve you well early in your career or mid-career can become problematic as you seek to move into leadership. That really resonated with me. However, I've been working with women leaders and aspiring women leaders around the world for the last 33 years now. And I noticed that he left out some of the classic behaviors that can undermine women. And that he also talked about a number of behaviors that as key and foundational that really aren't much of a problem for women at all, like learn to apologize or (laughs) don't always talk about how great you are. I don't find those uh, to be big problems among the women that I work with. So I suggested we collaborate on this book and it is in, in line with, this is the eighth book on leadership that I've written. Um, Usually having a focus on women, leaders or how women and men can work together optimally and build more inclusive cultures. So, so that's how I got here. That's, uh, that's what qualifies me to be here. Uh, that's really been my uh, passion, my mission, and my witness for the last 32 years. Well, Sally, I think the premise is something that we're both passionate about, and that is that, you know, what got you here won't get you there. You know, the vast majority of leaders have been promoted because they were a star individual contributor. And rarely, in fact, often in inverse correlation, are the skills that make you a great salesperson, do they make you a great sales leader or make you the top digital designer? Now you're promoted to be the leader of digital designers and you don't have those skills. So a lot of what you wrote in this book, I actually resonated with as a man married to a woman, but you don't say that, you know, all these insights are exclusive to women or challenging, but today we're going to focus for the purpose of your expertise and our interested audience on What are some of these challenges that do hold women back? Because whether you are a man or a woman, there are a lot of us that are male leaders that have responsibility for lifting women into leadership positions and making sure that they have feedback on their own blind spots. So I want to kind of episodically jump around today, recognizing that you don't make any declarative statements that this is only an issue that only women resolve, right? Or only that men face. You give some latitude that you may or may not find this 
resonates. But across the you know many decades you've been an author and a consultant, you've of course found some trends and um, some challenges. Let's talk first about relationships. I think one of your foundational points is that men and women kind of view relationships differently. And in many cases, women kind of fall short of some of the things that men might do around leveraging them. Riff on that topic for a moment. Certainly. This took me a long time to realize because back when I wrote, I wrote a book, The Female Advantage, Women's Ways of Leadership in 1990. It was the first book to look at what women had to contribute as leaders rather than how they needed to change and adapt. And what I noted in that book was the strength of the relationships that women built. And I saw that as a great advantage. And it became more of an advantage as organizations begin to recognize that building relationships was not a soft skill as it was considered in 1990, but is indeed a leadership skill. So I wondered why women hadn't benefited more from being skilled at building relationships. And what I came to conclude in the work that I did is that a lot of women, and you know, as you say, not all women, they're, you know, we're not making any blanket statements here, but a lot of the women that I saw working with, they were skilled at building relationships, but they were reluctant to leverage them. That is, they were reluctant to engage the people that they built a relationship with to uh, help them achieve either a tactical uh, job related or strategic career related objective. And when I would ask about it, they would say things like, well, I want people to know that I really like them or I value them as a friend and I'm not trying to take advantage of them. So they had this sort of either or idea that you were either friends with someone or you had a relationship that had an element of leverage and that that was very transactional and kind of even made you a bad person. So that's what I've been trying to work with. And that's what I work with in this behavior in the book, building rather than leveraging behavior, which can really keep women stuck. And, you know, when you think about it, asking people for help is the best way to engage them and the best signal to send that, hey, I'll be here for you in the future if you need help. So you become allies and resources for one another, which is different than necessarily friendship, but doesn't mean that friendship can't exist in that framework. Sally, you're not a psychiatrist, nor do you portray yourself as an expert on gender studies or such. Obviously, you're a multi-decade expert on leadership, and that's not in dispute. What's been your assessment? Because I'm sure you coach men as well as women across your career. What is your assessment why you think, in this case, men might perhaps be more adept at understanding how to make relationships a win-win, as Dr. Covey would say, while, while perhaps women may see it as sort of a, you know, a, a lose-win, or I'm only focused on your win. What do men see in this that maybe women don't? You know, I really think it's a question of experience because when women become focused on leveraging, building and leveraging relationships, they are phenomenal at it. And women ha who have come from a sales background are often very good at it, mm. uh, although they can come off as too transactional. And women are brilliant at leveraging relationships in the service of um, volunteer efforts that they may be, you know, uh, engaging somebody to help them in funding the domestic violence shelter down the street. Women are tigers when it comes to that. So I think it, it really has to do with the fact that women, um, that we were mostly raised with the emphasis on you need to be a wonderful person. You need to be a nice person. You need to help other people, but you don't. And the, the sort of corollary for that is you don't necessarily ask for help because that's impinging on other people. So I think it comes from just the presumption that, um, that, that there's something not very nice about thinking about leverage. And the more I spend time with effective leaders, the more I see that that's not true at all, that the most effective people who are really good at leveraging relationships, it, it works for the other person as well. So it's, it's, it's just what you said about Dr. Covey's uh, observation. It's, 
it's thinking in terms of win-win. Sally, great transition. You also shared this idea that in many cases, women you know, think about loyalty to their team, but sometimes at the expense of their own career ambitions. Uh, expand on that. Yeah, this is something that's that's fairly common. Women can get stuck. You know, again, happens with men too. But but it's it's, it's I see it quite commonly uh, that women will get stuck in an organization because they feel that their their team can't afford to lose them, or it would be in some way disloyal to their team, or betraying their team. Um, undermining their team if they moved on to the next position. And they'll sometimes feel that way about their boss as well as if they've had a boss that they feel is very supportive. And again, I think it's there's it's a, a sort of not thinking in terms of the win-win. Guess what? Your team might benefit more from your moving on to having a job where you had greater authority, influence, scope, and access to resources than by having you doing the job you're having right now. They might get more benefit from that because then they would know someone at a higher level and it would be good for them, good for their careers. So it, it's, I think it's thinking a little bit narrowly. And again, it comes from this sort of, you know, my job is to be a wonderful person and fulfill other people's expectations of me at all times that a lot of women grow up with. Sally, do you have an opinion as it relates to men on this topic? Do you think that men are more naturally inwardly focused, that they're not less loyal to their team, but they're more naturally ambitious? Do men do this better than women? Do they struggle with this the same? What, what are your thoughts on the, on the gender, male gender side of the same topic? I think men are more comfortable with ambition mm -hmm. and with uh, admitting to ambition and declaring ambition than women are because women may have had feedback, oh, she's too ambitious. You know, we see it in the, in, uh, you know, in political life, a woman who runs for a high office, oh, she's too ambitious. Well, guess what? She's running for a high office. She's obviously ambitious. So I think there are a lot of women who are reluctant to identify as ambitious. And that's one of the things I'm really working to change. You know, I, I, um, I taught, I was in conversation once with a, with a psychiatrist, I'm certainly not, uh, who worked on the Upper East Side in New York City, uh, she had very flourishing practice. Practically all her clients were women who were either in high profile investment firms or who were partners at very high profile New York City uh, law firms. And she said, one of the things that floored her is that she said about 60, 70% of the women who came in, the first thing they said to her is, I want you to know that I'm not ambitious. Now you don't get to be a partner in one of New York City's top law firms without being ambitious. That just doesn't happen. You don't just fall into it. It's not just that you worked hard and were a nice person. You have to have that ambition. But that's how reluctant these women who were exceptional were to claim ambition. So I think it's partly that, that, that women do have ambition. I don't think it's different. Sometimes it comes out later in life, fine. Um, but women do have ambition. It's just that we're that many women are still have inhibitions around admitting it even to themselves. Sally, I don't mean this to be a dangerous question, so you can answer it however you want. Do you think that men or other women subconsciously punish women who they perceive to be ambitious? Do you have any thoughts around that, or is that something that is nonsensical? I think that that's true. I think that that can be true. I think that that becomes less true over time. I think it was certainly true when I began doing a lot of this work in the early 90s. The idea, you know, men and women were both scathing. Well, she's just so ambitious. And what did they mean when they said this woman was ambitious? What they meant was she will step over, you know, dead bodies in order to achieve her objective. So it was a very, very negative perception. And I think that that impacted a lot of women and it filled them with fear. I don't want to be perceived of as ambitious. Um, what I'm trying to do and trying to model and also trying to, uh, in the workshops I do and with the clients I work with, get women comfortable with the idea you can be ambitious 
and be a wonderful person. It depends on what you're ambitious for. And if you're ambitious to make a contribution at the highest level in your organization, in your sector, in your field, in your community, that is a form of positive ambition. So I think that that spreading that message, uh, spreading that gospel is an important thing to do because it will help women get more comfortable with it. And I don't think men had that inhibition. Look, the, the workplace was designed for and by men. Women were not an active part of it, certainly not in leadership until the last, um, you know, 40, 30 years, right, right. 50 years, certainly wasn't wasn't happening. So so women had to get comfortable with some of this stuff. Sally, you write a chapter that I think you titled The Disease to Please. And uh, I'd like you to talk about the role that women have in a uh, desire to please others. But you use a great story about a woman I think you called Nancy. She started as a receptionist. She worked her way up in a medical center. And you know some of the skills that quote, got her here you know, weren't necessarily good for her later on. Will you talk about the disease to please and maybe riff on the Nancy story? Yeah, Nancy was a wonderful, um, a wonderful woman who I had worked with privately. She she was at a hospital system. She came from nowhere. She was very. Um, her family had the attitude, "Don't get above yourself." So she was always out to prove that she was not above herself, that she was not somebody who had a you know, big head or was conceited, et cetera. However, she was so accommodating and so skilled and so hardworking that she rose from being a receptionist who had not gone to college to being the head of all the, the patient and community relations for this very large medical system. Well, over the course of, I think, like, two or three decades and numerous promotions, right? Yeah, numerous constant promotions. So she got to this place and then the hospital company was acquired, typical, and she had a different kind of position. But this is where, so her disease to please, her desire to supply, to provide the best possible customer experience for the people that she served had been instrumental for her success. But when she got to the next level at a real leadership level, she was not in this customer facing, patient facing role anymore. Someone else was. And yet people, the, the patients, their families, they wanted to deal with Nancy because she was a wonderful person. So she kept getting pulled over to do part of that part of her old job all the time and that she felt like she couldn't say no they depend on me they need me etc so she was very invested in that wonderful person thing and as a result a she was kind of messing up the job that she had but b and this is more important she was undermining without really intending to or believing that she was the person who was uh, in that job now, and this is something pleasers do all the time. They swoop in, they take up the slack for other people because they feel, you know, they may not handle the relationships right, or they may take up slack for other people because they're concerned that they have too much to handle. So they're trying to help out. Um, they have a very tough time holding people to account for what um, for what they said that they would do, um, they have a tough time, you know, maintaining their own boundaries and not saying yes to too much. So as you can see, this is sort of a classic "what got you here won't get you there" habit. In that, you, you know, being a pleaser is very functional to a certain level. But once you get up to real authority and scope and where you do need to hold people to account, um, then it undermines you and can make your job impossible. And that's why I say that the disease to please along with the perfection trap, those are the two habits that are most toxic at a leadership level for women in my experience. Sally, I think one of the insights that I took away, and I, I, I could relate to a lot of these challenges. I don't, you know, again, I think this book could be how men rise, I mean, of, quite frankly. But I, I think one of the insights I took away from the Nancy story is that for those of us who have a disease to please, right? And I have some of that in me, and I yeah. think there's a lot of our leaders in our company at Franklin Covey that have the same, male and female. I can see a lot of people's careers in the Nancy story because what happens is as you kind of 
move up, you fill your wheelbarrow full of all of these commitments and obligations and you have kind of all this baggage, positive baggage, you know, on your cart. And at some point you've, 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 you've built a brand that your contribution is to please so many people and it can undermine your credibility and your ability to focus and do your current job because you've collected so much baggage along the way. Any advice you would give to people, male or female, that find that they've moved up in an organization and their, 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 their baggage cart is so full of all this baggage, not bad baggage, perhaps good baggage, that they find it's undermining their ability to do their current job. Yes, there are a couple of things. It's very helpful to, for example, get comfortable saying no to things or delegating responsibility without over explaining it, without apologizing for it, because that sort of demonstrates that you feel bad or it's somehow illegitimate that you're not taking on some extra work. So get in the habit of learning how to say that's not something that I can take on right now, or that doesn't fit with the parameters of the job that I have. And just saying it, not loading it up with a lot of explanation, because as you hear, as you hear yourself saying that, you'll become more comfortable. That's what I find, you become more comfortable um, saying that. The other thing is really look carefully at how you support people coming up. And, and try to recognize you don't help them by swooping in and giving them support rather than enabling them to find and build their own strengths and have their own experiences and build their own relationships even if they supplant the ones that you built. And, and I think because pleasers are people who are good people inherently good people with good values, that this is very helpful to them. That's what happened with Nancy. She recognized that the young woman who had taken her place, her successor, was having no luck in her job at all because Nancy was rushing in and, and getting in the way of her, her building, her opportunity to build the, uh, the patient relationship. So really think about, you know, this is something for parents too. You know, how much is my trying to solve this problem for my child or for my employee, how much is that going to hinder them from the strength and self-belief that will come to them when they find the solution themselves? Sally, I see so many corollaries between your work and that of Liz Wiseman, a friend of ours and a colleague at Franklin Covey. Liz calls that a rescuer, right, or a protector. One of the nine axonal diminishing tendencies is that you're accidentally rescuing someone or rushing in and not allowing them to grow. L let's pivot to the idea of communication, how women communicate differently. I think you say the chapter, you call it too many words, and I think your research shows that, that women speak on average about 20,000 words a day, and I believe you said that men speak on average about 7,000 words a day when you've got women that are working in, and often cases, a male-dominated, male-centric work environment, not always the case, but in many places the case, that women are considered to be either too chatty or they over-communicate. Uh, take that wherever you want to go and perhaps speak both to women and men. How can women be more intentional about their communication style and how can men better understand perhaps why women are doing what they're doing to the extent that resonates with women? Yeah, it's a great, uh, great question. In the book, we have the communication behaviors, which are minimizing and too much. Too much is, as you say, too many words, too much background, too much detail, too much explanation, uh, too much information. And what I have witnessed over decades is that women who are, who lack the ability to be crisp and concise when the situation would benefit from that, often come across as by providing a lot of information, they confuse the person that they're talking to. They can't, the person that they're talking to, that what is she getting at? Why is she giving me all this information? Is this important or is this important? And that's one of the reasons that, um, that women often, you know, have trouble attracting the, the, 
cons consent or you know affirmation of senior male leaders who may exemplify a very crisp, concise uh, communication style. And I've worked in companies where I've seen that over and over and over, where a woman will come in, she'll make a presentation, say, let me tell you how I got to this idea. Let me give you some background first. By the time she leaves, guy's going like, I, I don't know what she was talking about. Can anybody translate that for me? You don't want to be in that situation. And that situation is the result of the sort of amplification of um, of uh, conciseness and crispness in communication that happens when you have built a very strong male culture. Um, you know, how, how do I do this? Go over that way. Do this. Try that. That, that sort of low information um, exchanges that uh, that exist in, in certain cultures because they've been very, very heavily male dominated for a long time. And so it's it's a question, I, I think, for women, and I've, I've talked to women who've said, what made my career was that I learned to be extremely concise and clear in my communication. And I therefore um, coach other women in being more concise and more clear because there's a big benefit to that in this organization. So I think that for women an awareness, and it's just preparation. Being concise and clear when you go into a meeting is just preparation. And if you've got some interesting background information, instead of starting with that, say, here's, here's what I recommend. Interesting story about how I got to it. If you're interested, let me know, glad to share it with you. So that it's them asking you as opposed to you fronting it, you know, dumping it on them. So cultivating that, knowing exactly what you want to say and trying to figure out how can I say this in the fewest words? How can my email communications be as clear as possible and not expend a lot of words? That's another thing really important to do. That's a great advantage also for men. And I would say this is this is one of those habits that really often is more women. There, some of them. One of my big learnings from, uh, uh, since the book came out is how often men share these characteristics, and I've actually come to think of them as as the as the uh, habits that were left out of what got you here, Marshall's original book on the subject. But uh, this communication divide is very active, and if you want to position yourself as a leader and gain that credibility, and you are a person who's comfortable talking a lot and communicating in a way that's, I won't even say verbose, because that's negative, but where you, you use a lot of words, it's really a good uh, skill to develop and cultivate. And for men, I think it's, it's good to recognize that this can be a problem for some women. And when it is, confront it directly. Say, you know, I think that the way you're presenting this, it, it's really interesting. There's some interesting stuff in there, but I'm getting a lot of other information. So I'd love you to come back and give it another shot in a way where I don't feel like I have to pick through and try to figure out, you know, what the real point is in what you're saying. I think that would be very helpful to you. And by the way, so-and-so is really good at this. So why don't you go and talk to her? Because she may be able to give you some pointers. Sally, on that note, send us off and speak to the millions of male leaders that are listening. And whether they're in the C-suite or they're in middle or senior level management, what can male leaders do to help women that may have some of these blind spots. Like you just said, you, you, you shared a very nice role play of being you know, both courageous and considerate, as Dr. Covey would have a balance of courage and consideration. Are there any specific uh, uh, coaching tips or habits or phrases that you might offer to the men that are listening and watching that they could help women who are on the rise, perhaps rise more quickly, more influentially by intervening on some of these, these, uh, these self-defeating habits? Yeah, I think the intervention is is very important. And where I see it most typically is in a situation like this, um, where a male leader will suggest, you know, I'd like to recommend you for this next job. 
and you know this is a promotion i think you'd be really good at it and what you often hear is a woman say you know i don't really feel quite ready for that i don't i don't think i have all the skills to make it a success right away plus i still have some real learning to do in the job that i have and what men will often go away from that exchange thinking and i i've worked with them i've heard this a lot is, you know, I guess she really lacks ambition. You know, I thought she had more ambition or, you know, they could even think something like, you know, oh, maybe she's planning on getting pregnant and doesn't want a promotion, something like that. They're a little bit of mind reading. And instead of recognizing this, is a very common thing for women, women often believe that they should not take a job unless they have every single skill already, which of course, how do you get the skills? You get the skills by having the job. They believe they have to have all those skills already. They may have loyalty issues to their team and their boss that are holding them back. Um, they're overvaluing expertise and, um, and have a bit of risk aversion. So being able to recognize this as a common pattern and then pushing back on it and saying, you know, I hear you and I understand that you need to know nobody's going to expect you to have 100% of the skills that this job takes the day you take it. There's some very good support there for people who can help you to get up to speed. We really see you as being a potential leader here. And we want to put the opportunities in your way that will help you develop. So even if you feel that reluctance, I want you to consider this. And I want you to talk to a couple other people who could be helpful in as you think it through. And a couple other people you could recommend could be women who had been reluctant to take positions and then did. This is one of the most common things that happens in organizations. We're trying to develop our women. We offer them opportunities and then they're reluctant to take them. So that pushing back, that recognizing where that can come from, valuing your job over your career, overvaluing expertise, et cetera, it can be very, very helpful to men in uh, moving women, helping women move their careers forward. Sally, what's next for you on the horizon? What's next on your docket? What's next on my docket is I'm writing a new book. Um, signed the contract yesterday. Congratulations. Uh, with uh, Hachette, the publisher of, yeah. of How Women Rise. And this book is about how men and women can collaborate to create the next workplace, the post pandemic workplace, which is going to look in some fundamental ways quite different than the workplace that we have been inhabiting for the last 50 years, where men and women have often been, you know, building together, but it's been a little bit of a struggle. So we've got a chance to do something new here, uh, to do something that draws from positive experience of the last 50 years, but also really reconceives what is this thing called work going to look like and what is leadership going to work look like and how men and women can best collaborate on that. So I'm very excited about this project, interviewing some fascinating people and uh, very ready to move forward with this. Well, we look forward to having you back on if that opportunity exists. We'd love to feature you in Franklin Covey's annual Master Mentors book where we take 30 minds and build it inside out if you would have us. The book today is How Women Rise, Break the 12 Habits, Holding You Back from Your Next Raise, Promotion, or Job. Sally, thank you for joining us today on Leadership. Oh, Scott, it's been a pleasure. Really very grateful to be invited. Thanks everybody as well. If you're not subscribing to On Leadership, visit franklincovey.com. Click on the subscribe link. You can invite all your friends, family, colleagues to do so. You're welcome to also subscribe to us on all your favorite podcast platforms. And we'll see you back here next week for a new conversation on leadership.